everybody, Lawyer Autumn Whit Boyd here. I'm so glad to be back with you for this week's installment of the Legal Roadmap Podcast and our Facebook Live series. So we are keeping with our trend for online course creators, and this week's episode is all about what you need to know to prevent your online course, your online digital downloads, your online website, uh, from being copied. So we're going to talk about copycats. We're going to talk about the thing that I get tons and tons of questions about from online course creators who are wanting to make sure that their content, their name, everything about their course business can't be ripped off by somebody who is trying to piggyback on their fans, their um, the things that they've worked so hard to build. I get um, concerns about this a lot, especially from new course creators, because they are diving into something unknown. They are putting a lot of work and time and energy on into it, and they want to make sure that all that hard work is going to be protectable. So we're going to talk about a couple things in this episode. First, I'm going to talk about what are the scenarios where this comes up, just so that you kind of have an idea of when you might expect something to happen. Then we're gonna talk about what you can actually do preventively. So I am a big fan of doing things now that cost a little bit of time and money to prevent having to deal with issues later that are gonna cost a lot of time and money. So if we can avoid problems later by doing a little bit of work now, I am all for that. And I'm guessing that you are too. Um, and then the last thing we're gonna talk about is if you find yourself in the scenario of someone copying your course name or a student ripping off your content or a competitor copying your website, what are the concrete steps that you can take to actually deal with that issue? So we're going to look at this issue from all sides today. All right, let's dive in. And just before I get started, I want to mention this is episode 112 of the Legal Roadmap podcast. So show notes for this episode are going to be at awfirm, awbfirm.com slash podcast and then the number 112. So podcast episode 112 is where you can find the show notes. Everything that I mentioned today will be linked there. Uh, I am going to refer to a couple other episodes. So if you want to grab links to those, those will all be in the show notes. All right. So what are, oh, before I jump in, my standard disclaimer, which is I am a lawyer. Uh, I am licensed to practice law in Tennessee, but I'm not your lawyer unless you hire our law firm to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. So please take everything today as just information. It is not legal advice. And this is definitely an area where if someone has copied something that's really important to your business, you are going to want to consult with a lawyer on your own to make sure that you get the best uh, advice for your specific situation. All right. So starting first with some examples of when this might come up in your business. Um, and I'm going to start out by mentioning that I will be talking about both copyrights and trademarks today. And a lot of times these two types of intellectual property get kind of lumped in together because they are very similar, but they are a little bit different. And the ways that you're going to go about combating copycats are going to be a little bit different with copyrights versus trademarks. So the first instance that I see sometimes with um, copycats coming up in an online course business is if a competitor copies your course name or your entire business name or your website domain name. So that is all going to be a type of trademark infringement. We'll talk about copyrights in a minute, but if it's something to do with the name or your logo, these are all protected by trademark law. So they're things that identify the source of your products or services in your business. When a student is looking for Amy Porterfield's courses, they are going to type in amyporterfield.com and they're going to expect to go to her website or they're going to use one of the um, course names, a product name that she is well known for, like Digital Course Academy. Those are all going to be trademarks. Same thing with Marie Forleo and B School. You know, those are very well known, identifiable course names. Those are all protected by trademark law. So that is one scenario where this can come up. You find someone else trying to confuse your students, trying to steal people who are trying to find your course by having either the same or a very similar name. Now, I'm just gonna mention kind of one of our basic tenets of trademark law in the United States is that it is intended to prevent customers from being confused. So if you have someone selling a totally different kind of product under the same name as you, like let's say it's um, plumbing supplies or um, just something totally different, not an online course, not even in the education realm, then that may not be a problem because it's very unlikely that your customers are going to be confused. But what we're talking about here is someone selling uh, an online course, a piece of online education, that is similar to yours. Um, and I will say, I think that the field of online education is small enough that even if it's an online course on a different topic, it could still be confusing to people trying to find your course who might accidentally end up 
on the website for another course. So let's say even if you teach about marketing and this other course is something about, I don't know, guitar or something, you know, pretty different. It's still the same type of product. It's still the same type of customer who's probably looking for an online course. So that could still be confusing. But I'll give you an example of something that would not be confusing. Actually, I learned a new example. Um, my favorite example of brands that can coexist because they sell two totally different things is I like to talk about Delta Airlines and Delta Faucets because they're totally different. Someone who's shopping for a shower head is not going to be confused when they end up on the website for Delta Airlines. They're gonna know immediately they're in the wrong place. They're gonna go find the place that they're supposed to be. Um, another example of this that I just heard this week was um, Dove Chocolate and Dove Soap. So again, same name, Dove. It's a registered trademark probably for both businesses, but two totally different product lines. And if you're looking for soap, you're not gonna be confused when you find Dove Chocolate. You're gonna know it's not what you're looking for. So same thing with online courses, and if it's a totally different kind of product, that's not going to be confusing. All right, the second scenario where I see this come up a lot is uh, you've got a successful course, you've had a lot of people go through it, and you notice that one of your students has now launched their own course on the same topic. Now this is tricky because we all want our students to succeed, we want them to learn and flourish, and especially if you're in the if you're teaching business um, ideas, marketing or sales or finance or you know anything about running a business, it's very likely that the people who are taking your course are also working on their own businesses. And they may wanna follow in your footsteps. They may wanna teach on similar topics to you. And this is an area where it's a really fine line as to whether it's a problem if a student starts their own course on a similar topic to yours or even on the exact same topic. So I just wanna mention now we are in the realm of copyright. So copyright law is going to protect things that we think of as creative works. So an online course, the content of the online course, not the name, but the content, the, all the bits and pieces, the videos, the outline, the um, PDF worksheets or workbook that you give your students, um, all the different things that you include in your course, those are all going to be protected under copyright law. They're all considered creative works. So. Copyright law is a little bit different than trademark law because with copyright law, we don't really care if a customer is confused or not. The issue with copyright law is just, did they copy your work? And so here's where if someone has taken your course, they've, they've absorbed your ideas, they have learned from you, and then they take it and they put their own spin on it, they've not copied your materials, they have kind of created their own outline, they've made their own videos, they've put together their own worksheets, um, if they have used your ideas but created their own thing from it, that is probably not copyright infringement because in the United States, copyright law does not protect ideas. So we're only going to be able to protect our course in the way that we are expressing our ideas. So the exact scripts that we're using in our video, those are protected under copyright. But the ideas and the things that we're teaching in our videos are probably not protectable under copyright. Now, if you have a really unique way of teaching or um, unique examples or things like that, those may be protectable, but for probably 99% of online courses, let's say you teach a course about Facebook ads and you are showing people how to use the Facebook ads manager, some best practices, you give them ideas, you um, tell them how to run a campaign, how to put, put together their ad sets. All of that is probably not protectable. If you have a very special spin that you put on things, let's say you have a particular way that you do things, or you have a, a spreadsheet that you send to people that shows them how to put together things, or um, you have a, a process or a system, that may be protectable. Um, but just the general way of doing things is probably not protectable. So this can be very tricky, and I think a lot of us kind of get our feelings hurt if we see a student go through our course and copy us and you know launch a course on the same topic, teaching a lot of the same things. But it is a very difficult thing to enforce under our copyright laws unless they are actually using your things verbatim. So if someone actually copies your video and uses your exact video or your exact slides in their course, or they copy your worksheet, or they use you know paragraphs of wording from your worksheets or from some um, resources that you share, that is probably going to be an issue. Verbatim copying is always going to be a violation of copyright law. Um, it's probably never gonna be fair use. If you wanna know about fair use, I talked about that in my last solo episode. So go back and listen to that, talking about using other people's work in your course the right way. Uh, but most of this that I'm talking about today is not going to fall into fair use. It's going to be 
if they're copying you directly, if they're using your stuff and putting it right into their course, that is an issue. But if it's someone just launching a course on the same topic or the same ideas, that is very difficult to shut down. So I know that's something that a lot of us worry about. And I think what I would say to you to kind of give you some comfort is that if you are further along than your student and you have been doing this a while, you have a really solid course, you've got a great audience, you've got a good connection with them, you've formed relationships, those are the things that are going to make your business successful. And so I would just kind of encourage you not to worry quite so much about a student coming up behind you and trying to steal your thunder by teaching the same thing because they are never going to replicate you exactly. They're always going to have their own spin that they put on it. They're not gonna have your exact background and experience and connections. So it's always going to be a little different. And if they're a few steps behind you, they're probably not that much of a threat anyway. So I would encourage you in that scenario to just kind of keep your eyes on your own paper, do the best job you can. Maybe you wanna reach out and let them know that you kind of, you see them. Um, but I don't think that you're necessarily going to want to take some of these other steps that I'll talk about when we get to the part of this podcast dealing with copier, copycats. All right, so the last scenario where I see this come up is if someone has copied a blog post or let's say you have a sales page on your website that is really beautifully written and someone has kind of copied and pasted it onto their website or if they've copied images. Um, I, it's kind of the same tenant that I was talking about a minute ago. This is all protected by copyright law. So if you are writing website copy, if you're writing a newsletter, if you're writing a blog post, that's all protected under our copyright laws. Uh, images, videos, music, all of those things are also going to be protected under our copyright laws. So if you have someone who is literally copying and pasting a blog post, um, that is very clear copyright infringement. However, if you have someone who just sees your blog post, think, oh, that's, that's a great idea. Um, I'd like to write something similar, but they put their own spin on it. They use their own words. They're not copying you exactly. That is the, the type of thing that's also, just like I was talking about with courses, is very hard to go after. So if it's verbatim copying, and that means like an exact copy, they are copying and pasting, or they are right-clicking on an image, copying your image and putting it on their website, that is almost always gonna be copyright infringement. But taking an idea that you had and writing it in their own words or taking their own spin on it is gonna be hard to, to combat. Uh, the other thing to think about and that I see sometimes is someone copying the look and feel of a website. So. Let's say you have hired a designer to create this absolutely beautiful website and it's got a really distinct um, layout. It's got uh, specific colors that people have come to associate with you and your brand. Um, it's got a particular way that the images and the words are laid out that is not just what you're seeing on everybody else's website. If you do have a really particular look and feel on your website, it can't just be like a template, like what we see on everybody else's website. But if you have a really custom, really individual look and feel on your website that people associate with your brand, that can be protectable under trademark law. It's a really funny part of trademark law that we call trade dress. And it's what applies to things like pa product packaging. So it's um, the look and feel of a brand is basically what is protected under trade dress. So keep that in mind, again, the more similar it is to yours, the more likely it is that it's going to be trademark infringement. And with trademarks, again, we have to keep in mind, we're thinking about would a customer be confused if they landed on this other website because it looks so much like yours, they're not even sure which website they're on. Um, they could be confused and accidentally buy from the other person because they thought they were on your website. That's kind of the standard that we have to keep in mind. It has to be confusing to an average customer. So look and feel of the website could also be an issue. All right, I hope those examples were helpful in just framing um, the kinds of infringement that we're talking about in this episode. So what do you actually do to hopefully prevent someone from copying you, to stop all these copycats in their tracks before they become a problem? There are a couple things that you can do right now to stop copycats from becoming a problem. So the first thing that I would recommend is to have good terms of use, terms of service, sometimes they're called, on your website, terms and conditions. They're called lots of different things. You usually see them linked in the footer of your website. And so that is where you can put people on notice that you think you own the intellectual property rights in whatever you are claiming. So it could be your blog posts, your website copy, your images. Um, if you've got videos or other content on your website, you can tell people, hey, I own this, and you can tell them whether they're allowed to copy it or not. So you're putting them on notice that you are asserting rights and that they do not have permission to use it. So sometimes that just that in itself 
will stop people in their tracks. Now, not everybody is gonna click on your terms and conditions. So another thing to think about is having a notice on the bottom of your website that says the C in a circle, so copyright, C in a circle, the year, or it could be a range of years if you've had your website up for a while, and then your name or your business name, whoever owns the content, and the statement all rights reserved, or no copying without advance permission, or you can kind of write it however you want, whatever fits with your brand voice. But that is gonna be on the bottom of every single page of your website. And so that is really clearly gonna put people on notice without having to click through to your terms and conditions or look anywhere else. It's gonna put them on notice right there. Hey, I own this stuff and you are not allowed to use it. So having good terms of terms and conditions, terms of service, terms of use on your website, and then also a really clear copyright notice in your footer are a good idea. And I would say do this with all of your materials. So if you've got a workbook that you um, send out to your students in PDF, slap that notice on it. If you've got um, uh, landing pages or sales pages that um, you know are not your normal um, layout of your website, go ahead and put that on there also. Um, I would put it on your videos, you know, not necessarily on the actual frame, but you know, on the pages where your videos are shown. Um, if, if you use a course platform or something like that, this is possible to add. Just wanna kind of spread it everywhere, let people know what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. That will go a long way. Um, another thing that is really, really important is to include terms about copyright and trademark in the actual terms of use that your students agree to when they buy your course. So hopefully, if you listen to other episodes, you are using terms of use with your students. That's the contract between you and your students. So when someone buys a course or a digital download from you, they have to hopefully check a box saying they agree to your terms of use. Some of them will read it, many of them will not, but it's binding whether they read it or not, as long as they you know, show that they've taken some affirmative action that they agree to it. That is the contract they have agreed they're gonna abide by all these terms. And so if you do find someone has copied you, um, you can go back and refer to that and it will give you some ways to deal with them, which we'll talk about in a minute. But if they are looking at it on the front end, hopefully they will see you have some terms that say, you know, this is for your personal use only. You cannot take this and use it to, um, to you, can't, you can't sell any of my materials or you can't use any of my materials without my permission. You are only allowed to use it for one person for your own use. Um, so you can have some really clear terms about your intellectual property right there in the contract that your students sign. And just having it there will have kind of a preventive effect. For anyone who actually reads it, um, hopefully they will note that, they will say, mm, she really takes her intellectual property seriously, so I am definitely not going to copy any of her stuff, or um, you know, I'm gonna be careful, I'm not gonna share this around. You can also have terms in there about you know, not sharing passwords, and there's some other things that you can do as a preventive measure in your terms of use right there, your agreement with your, con with your students or the contract that applies if you're selling a digital product or a digital download. So that can be really helpful, that can go a long way. And then the last thing that I would encourage you to do is, especially if it's the second or third time that you've run your course, if you know it's profitable, you know you're gonna stick with it for a while, would be to actually register the copyrights in that course content and register the trademark in the course name. Now, you know me if you listened to the podcast, I don't necessarily recommend that every brand new course creator run to the copyright office or run to the trademark office and lock down all of your rights right away. Because I find that a lot of us make a lot of changes right from the beginning. And so um, we might iterate, we might change the name or we might change a lot of the content. And there is a cost associated, even if you do it yourself without an attorney, um, there is a cost in registering your trademarks and registering your copyrights. But once you have found success, once you have found a course that is profitable and you're not planning on totally overhauling all of the content, you're not gonna be recording new videos next week, you're not gonna be changing the name, once you've got something that is working, it is a really, really good idea to go ahead and register those copyrights and trademarks. Now, the law is a little different for each of these. With copyrights, you cannot file a lawsuit until you actually have a copyright certificate in your hands. It ha you have to file the application, the Copyright Office has to approve it, and then you have to actually receive that certificate in order to file a lawsuit. The reason that's important is that when we talk in a minute about how you actually go after copycats if you find that they've done something, is you're gonna want some leverage. You're gonna want something to be able to threaten that you're gonna do. And if they receive your threat, they, they receive a cease and desist letter, 
and they know that you're not registered, you haven't registered those copyrights, they know you can't actually follow through. They know you can't file a lawsuit because you haven't taken those steps that are prerequisite, absolutely mandatory. Um, and also they know that your damages are gonna be pretty small. If you register your copyright after you find that someone has already copied you, your damages that you can get are much, much smaller than if you register early. So there's a lot of incentives built into the system to register your copyrights. So I highly, highly recommend that if you have a course you're gonna stick with for a bit, go ahead and register those copyrights. And you can listen to episode uh, 99 for more information about registering your copyrights. Trademark law is a little different. You don't have to register your trademarks in order to be able to file a lawsuit, but it's a good idea and it's going to make enforcement much, much easier. So I'll talk more about how you can use a trademark registration in a minute. But uh, similar to, to copyright registration, the trademark process is very long. It can take a year or longer to actually get that trademark certificate. So if you wanna take advantage of some of the ways you can enforce your rights, if you have a registered trademark, again, you gotta do it early because you're not gonna actually be able to take advantage of those for probably a year or more. So this is, these are two areas where spending a little money and time early to protect your content and protect your course name or your business name really pay off later when a copycat rears his or her ugly head. So, okay, those are my preventive tactics. Good terms of service or terms and conditions or terms of use on your website, a good copyright notice on the footer of your website and all of your course materials and then using a good terms of use with your students. So that contract with your students, you wanna make it really clear what they are and are not allowed to do with your content, and then registering your copyrights and trademarks if you want to be able to enforce them is just a no-brainer. All right, so here, the last thing I'm gonna go over is the actual steps that, again, this is not a recommendation, this is not legal advice, but these are frankly the things that I typically do with my own clients when we find ourselves in these, these situations. So step number one, before you do anything, before you call your best friend and cry about it, before you call your lawyer, before you send a mean message to the person, document, 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 document everything. I suggest you either take a screenshot or print things out. Um, you want to have evidence of the infringement. So if you find a sales page, if you find people talking about it in a Facebook group, if you find somebody posting about it on Instagram, wherever you are finding the infringement, you want to capture that data. And I want you to think about if you had to go to court, if you had to go in front of Judge Judy and you had to prove that this person had copied you, what would you need to show? Um, ideally, if it's a website, you want the URL, if it's a social media account, you want the screen name of the account. You might even want some information about the account. So if you can click on the about or get you know some of their profile information, tying it to a particular person or a particular business. Um, and ideally you wanna be able to capture the date. So most of our screen grab, screen captures, there is the ability to capture a date with that as well. But that is gonna be the bare minimum of what you wanna capture. Um, you know, just copying and saving a picture or things like that are not as good as if you can get a really good um, screen capture with the URL, the social media handle, the date, as much information as you can gather as possible is going to be better. Just more information is better when you're gathering this evidence. And again, you wanna do this before you take any action. Because let me tell you, once you reach out to this person, and even if you start talking about it with your friends, you know, word can kind of spread, um, it can disappear. And so if you don't capture it right away, it can be really hard to get it later. So document, document, document. You are going to want some evidence in your file if you need it later. So if all of this doesn't work and you need it later, you wanna have it and you wanna have an evidence of the date that you actually first found it because that can be really important. All right, so what do you do next? Um, it's up to you. This is, again, just my approach, but I typically start with a friendly request and I typically will have the client do it, not me. So rather than bringing in the lawyer <laughs> right out of the gate, that can sometimes seem like dropping a bomb. Um, and it can be scary and overwhelming to the other person. Um, I typically recommend that my client actually reach out themselves. So either if you can find an email address, send an email. If you can't, you know, maybe send a DM through social media. If you can't find any um, easy way to contact them, you might even send just a paper letter back, back to the dark ages here. Um, but a friendly request, reach out in a friendly way. Try not to say anything that's going to compromise you, um, but 
just be friendly. Say, hey, I noticed you're doing X, Y, Z. Um, you know, my company has ABC. I think that there could be an issue here. I think this is violating my copyright or my trademark rights. Um, I would not give too many specific examples about like customer confusion or lost sales or any of that. I would try and keep this pretty high level um, as, as your first reach out. But just say, you know, basically like, I see you. I don't think what you're doing is okay. I would really appreciate if you stopped it. Um, and you can, depending on your style, depending on uh, the way that you like to communicate, you can include things like, you know, hey, I understand you've probably worked really hard on this and I understand that and I'm not trying to kick you when you're down, but um, you know, I have to protect my own rights. I've worked really hard and I've spent a lot of money and time and energy building my brand or building my course. And so uh, I have to protect it. So that's the first idea after you document everything is a friendly reach out. And honestly, a lot of the time it works and the person is either embarrassed, either they didn't know they were doing something wrong or um, they knew it was wrong and they were just hoping you wouldn't notice. <laughs> can go either way. Uh, but a lot of times people will just comply right away. You would be amazed at how many people just, maybe they don't even respond, but they change their social media account handle or they change their course name or they take it down. Um, you know, a lot of the times this works. So that's why I always recommend starting this way. And then you, you still look good. Um, it doesn't, it's not, um, you know, tarnishing your reputation at all. If that doesn't work, or if you get pushback, which happens sometimes, um, you might have a not so friendly request, um, especially if they're totally um, radio silence, if you're not getting a response at all. You know, you can reach out again. Again, this would be you, not your attorney. Um, and just say, you know, hey, I, I contacted you on X date. I haven't heard back. If you don't get back with me, you know, I'm gonna have to get in touch with my lawyer about next steps, or I'm gonna, um, have to maybe file some takedown notices or I'm going to take further action to make you basically make you comply. So that would be the next step would be a not so friendly either letter, communication, request, phone call, however you want to do it. Um, and remember through all of this, what I mentioned at the outset is this is a negotiation. So I want you to think about what is your leverage? What can you either what do you have that they want or what can you threaten to take away that they don't want to lose or what can you threaten to do that they don't want to happen? So typically, um, you know, you can threaten to shut down their social media accounts. You can threaten to shut down their website. You can threaten to actually file a lawsuit. Um, you could threaten, you know, if you've got mutual contacts, if you're in the same community. Um, I don't know that this is a great idea, but you could threaten to, you know, kind of out them. Um, and make them look bad, damage their reputation. Uh, that would probably be my last um, ad uh, advice about um, your leverage because you don't want to get into defamation area, which can happen if you're saying things that are not true about someone and it damages their reputation or their business. Um, but you can definitely threaten to take legal action that you're totally entitled to, like filing a lawsuit. Um, and again, often, just threatening to do something, letting them know that you've got an attorney on standby and you're ready to escalate it may be enough that they will comply. But not always. So your next step might be a takedown. And so there's a couple of different ways you can do this. If you have a trademark or copyright registration certificate, it is so much easier. There are forms that you can fill out on every social media platform. They make it really easy. Um, you will tell them what you think is infringing. You will give them your registration number and usually they will take it right down. Now the other side will have a chance to respond. So if they don't think they're infringing, they can respond. And some of the social media channels will kind of get involved and see what they think and others will just say, oh, they responded and they'll put it back up. So your mileage kind of varies with some of these, but it's a good option. A lot of people don't respond, especially if they know they're in the wrong once their social media account has been taken down um, or a YouTube account or um, websites are a little bit more difficult, but um, a lot of businesses, you know, are running a lot on social media. And so if you are able to get to their social media accounts and disable them, that becomes a really strong piece of leverage. So think about that. Um, that also works on Amazon. Uh, again, if you, really are gonna want a trademark registration so that you can register with the Amazon brand registry and that's gonna be your best way to shut down copycats on Amazon. Um, but social media, um, YouTube, uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, all the major social media platforms have very easy takedown uh, procedures. Um, they are much more effective if you have a registration. 
So that is an option. And again, you can do that without hiring a lawyer. You can do that yourself. Now I will point out, you are swearing under penalty of perjury. Anything that you are putting in most of these takedown notices, definitely with copyright, trademark is a little muddier, but with copyright, you are pretty much always swearing under penalty of perjury. And that means it's like you are putting your right hand up and your left hand on the Bible and you are swearing that everything is true as best you know. So um, you wanna be careful with what you put in any takedown notice to make sure that it's really true that you're not pushing the line there. So if that doesn't work, let's say either they respond and it goes back up or you aren't able to get the social media platforms to take things down. I will say with trademarks, it can be more difficult if it's not if it's not the exact same words as your trademark, they are sometimes kind of stingy about taking things down. Um, your next best bet is probably to hire a lawyer to actually send a cease and desist letter on their letterhead. And I will tell you, there is just something about receiving a letter from an actual lawyer that kind of raises the stakes a little bit because you know the other person has spent some money, unless they have a lawyer in the family, which is sometimes happens, but unusual. Um, you know that they have kind of started to put their money where their mouth is and that they are taking the issue seriously and that they are probably not going to go away. So that's the impression that you want to give if you are the one who's been copied. So sending a cease and desist letter, and that can be for copyright or trademark infringement, um, it's frankly not that different from the um, communications you've already had. It's just a little bit more serious and you get a lawyer who's actually using all the legal terms and um, putting things in the right context, citing statutes and saying what you can do if they don't comply. So it just kind of raises the bar a little bit on your negotiations because now they know, oh, this person could probably actually file a lawsuit. They've got a lawyer who's ready to go. So a lot of times just having a cease and desist letter from a lawyer will get the other person's attention and get them to take you more seriously and can resolve the issues or at least start a negotiation where you can get the issues resolved. Um, a lot of times we will have back and forth if the other person has a lawyer or I'll have back and forth just with the other person. Um, and we're usually able to negotiate either a compromise or they will just you know, do what we asked. Um, the very last step, if you cannot get the other person to do what you've asked, is to take that last step of actually filing a lawsuit. Now, I didn't mention, or I mentioned website URLs. There's kind of a whole different um, system for fighting about domain names. So if you have a popular course name, um, it doesn't even have to be your URL. So you could have a URL that's your actual name. Like if you're doing business under a personal brand, let's say I had, I don't have a website, but if I had a website that was autumnwhitboyd.com, but I sold my legal roadmap um, contract template bundle on that website. Um, and then somebody else started a website called legalroadmap.com. Uh, I might still be able to, because I do, I, I don't know if you can see it behind me, but I do have a trademark registration for legal roadmap um, from the USPTO. So I have, I have strong rights in that name. So even though my URL is not that, I am using that in my business. And so if someone else had legalroadmap.com and they were selling an online course or uh, contract template, something similar that would be competing with me, I could start what's called a domain dispute. And it's not exactly a court, it's this tribunal, um, it's an international system because you've got people owning URLs around the world. It is less expensive than filing a lawsuit, but it is still pretty expensive for a small business. You're looking at probably several thousand dollars to get started. The filing fees are a couple thousand dollars, so it's not cheap, but it's really fast. Um, a lawsuit is gonna take a year or two or more. Uh, these domain dispute proceedings are like 60 days, 90 days. They're very, very quick. I know that may not seem really quick if someone's stealing your sales, but in law, that is really quick. Um, you are definitely gonna wanna have a lawyer if you're going through that procedure because the documents that you have to file are basically like filing a lawsuit. So it's not something you wanna DIY. It's definitely worth um, hiring a lawyer and working with a lawyer. If um, it's a domain that is causing you a lot of problems though, that investment may be worth it. So something to think about. It, that's only with regard to URLs and domain name disputes. Um, if it's not a URL, if it's something else in your business, someone's copied your course content or has copied your course name or is causing you problems on social media, um, those things would be just a regular lawsuit. Copyright lawsuits have to be filed in federal court. So that means uh, that is the, it's not in every state, there are both federal and state courts. So federal are um, part of the federal government that runs our entire US. Um, the state courts are run by the state. 
So copyright claims ha are a federal law. It's the same in all 50 states. So copyright claims can only be filed in federal court. And I will tell you, I clerked for a federal judge. I have done mostly federal law work in my career. I much prefer to be in federal court. Um, it's very rule-based. Um, it is very predictable, but it is a very expensive place to file lawsuits. Uh, the lawyers who practice there are usually more expensive uh, because it is so rule-based. You really have to know what you're doing if you're in federal court. State court is a little more loosey-goosey. Um, so if you are thinking about filing a copyright lawsuit, I just want to let you know that it, you know, you're probably looking at $10,000 to get started with a complaint and then hundreds of thousands of dollars if it goes all the way through discovery and to a verdict. So big, big, big investment. If you've got a million dollar course though, and someone's copied it, then maybe that's worth it. Uh, and typically what will happen with at every step of this process is you're hoping to just come to an agreement. So when you file a lawsuit, you're not really hoping you're going to have to go all the way to a jury trial. It's very expensive. It takes a long time. You're hoping you're going to be able to get on the same page as the other side, reach a settlement, reach a compromise, and then everybody goes their separate ways. Um, trademark lawsuits can be brought in either federal or state court. So you kind of have a choice. Um, like I said, because of my background working in a federal court and practicing a lot in front of federal courts, um, I tend to favor federal courts just because they see more trademark lawsuits. They're used to dealing with them. Um, in state courts, they're just not as frequent. Um, so it's going to be less expensive probably to bring it in state court, but it's probably going to be slower. Um, and you're probably going to get a judge and uh, lawyers on the other side who are not as accustomed to working through trademark issues. So, and as I mentioned, you cannot sue for copyright infringement until you have that certificate. You can sue for trademark infringement, even if you don't have a certificate. Um, I will mention one of my favorite hacks, uh, it's not a hack, a trick, I don't know what to call it. Uh, one of my favorite tips, I mentioned before a way that you can prevent um, some copyright or trademark infringement is to include some terms in your terms of use with your students. So when you sell your course to a student, they're agreeing to your terms of use, your contract with your students. One of my favorite tips that I have, and I always include this in my clients' terms of use, unless they, <laughs> unless they don't want me to, is um, a term that covers what happens if a student uses your content without your permission. So by including that in a contract, I've now taken that out of being a copyright infringement claim and I've made it a breach of contract claim. I'm not gonna get in the weeds here, but I will just tell you, then you can file a lawsuit in what's called small claims court, which is very inexpensive, very easy, very user-friendly. You don't necessarily have to have a lawyer to file a lawsuit there. Um, and it makes it much easier to enforce those rights without having to spend $10,000 just to get started. So I would highly recommend that you think about adding some terms to your contract. Uh, our contract templates that we sell in my online store are going to have that term in them. It's kind of some magic language that will help you and will give you just another avenue of enforcing your rights if you do find that someone has copied you. Because they're basically agreeing that if they copy your stuff in a way that you said they weren't supposed to, that they're going to pay you some, some damages. And if they don't, now they have breached the contract and you can sue them in small claims court, much easier, much cheaper, um, much more quick. So that is my favorite tip about, um, again, it won't prevent copying, but it gives you a nice remedy if you do find yourself in the scenario of someone, especially a student, um, copying your content without permission. All right, I just laid a bunch of stuff on you um, about copyrights and trademarks and copycats, so I hope this was helpful. Um, if you are looking for more information about this, I highly recommend you go listen to the episodes that I mentioned, which were 99 and 106, talking more about copyrights and trademarks. There's some great information and both of those. And on the show notes page for this episode, we will include some swipe copy that you can use to send out your own cease and desist letters. So that's going to be at awbfirm.com slash podcast 112. You'll be able to download that there absolutely free. And that should help get you started if you find yourself in the unfortunate situation of being copied. Um, be sure to tune in next week. I'm going to have an interview with one of my clients and friends who is a superstar course creator. So you don't want to miss that. I will talk to you next week.